I begin in the name of the God whose mercy is profound, whose kindness is forever. Why Islam? Why believe in the Prophet? May God's mercy be on him. I've already mentioned that there are four different categories of arguments that we find in the Quran that present the case of the Prophet, may God's mercy be on him, as a genuine representative of God. The reader has to feel comfortable with the idea that the Quran is God's book and the messenger of God is indeed his representative. So, Quran has presented the character of the Prophet as one evidence. The message that he brought in the form of the Quran is another evidence. And a third evidence is the prophecies that were already there in the earlier books confirming that another Prophet would come. So the Quran mentions the fact that the Prophet of God, may God mercy on him, has come to confirm the prophecies that were already there regarding his arrival. So the Quran mentions that the Prophet and the Quran are musaddiq. They confirm. He is confirming what is already there in the earlier books in the form of prophecies, that those prophecies are correct and his arrival has confirmed that what was prophesied has come true. So that the Quran mentions uh, the fact in Surah Al-Anam chapter 6 verse 20, Yarifunahu kama yarifuna abnahum. These people of the book, at least their scholars, they recognize him, recognize the Prophet as much clearly as they recognize their own sons. That is, their clarity about the fact that Muhammad, God's mercy be on him, is the messenger of, of God, is as clear, as unambiguous as their understanding that that boy is my son. So, the Quran mentions this claim and obviously it gives a reason for the reader to go back to the earlier books and find out whether this claim is based on evidence, based on arguments or not. We know that the Bible is comprised of a number of books and it's divided into two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. We know that the Old Testament is believed in by both Jews and Christians, whereas the New Testament is a part of the Bible which is believed in by the Christians only. I will take one mention, one prophecy from each of these two parts of Bible. Let's take the Old Testament first. The first five books of the Old Testament are called Torah or Pentateuch. The fifth of these five books is the book of Deuteronomy. In the opinion of uh, some Muslim scholars, it is this book of Deuteronomy, which is Torah, that has been presented in its original form in the right sequence. In the book of Deuteronomy, we find that there is a prophecy that has been mentioned in its chapter 18, verses 17 to 19. The prophecy says, God Almighty mentioned to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. If anyone doesn't listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. So, there is a mention of the fact that a prophet 
is going to come in the later time after Moses. May God's mercy be on him. Now let's take the different components of this prophecy one by one. One part of the prophecy says that the prophet to come will be a prophet like you. That is, a prophet like Moses. Now, if we were to ask Christians as to who this prophet was, normally they would reply by saying that he was Jesus. In other words, in the understanding of Christians, Jesus Christ came and fulfilled this prophecy. He is the one who was prophesied. But the fact of the matter is that when we look at Moses and Jesus, we find that there are very few features which both share with each other. In other words, the expression a prophet like you doesn't seem to be fitting into the personality of Jesus Christ. Moses was born naturally, he died naturally. Jesus was born miraculously and his death or disappearance from this world is still a mystery, is still a debate, is still a controversy where different points of view exist. Moses had a large following during his lifetime. Jesus had, a, had very few people, disciples who believed in him and accepted him as the representative of God during his lifetime. Moses brought a law. Jesus didn't bring a law. He mentioned clearly that he is here to follow the law of Moses. Moses fought battles, did jihad. Jesus didn't fight, fight a battle in his lifetime. Moses migrated from Egypt to Palestine. Jesus Christ didn't migrate to any place. So, all in all, if we look at the two prophets of God, they're very different from each other. And one more feature, Moses had family, had a family. Jesus was a bachelor all along. Now, if you look at all these features of Moses that I've talked of and compare him with Muhammad, the last prophet, may God be pleased with all of them, you would find that he shares with Moses all these features. They are common to both. Natural birth, natural death, large following, a law that they both brought, Sharia. They fought battles, they both migrated, and they both had families. Not surprisingly, therefore, the Quran mentions clearly that the Almighty sent to the people of Quraysh a prophet who was similar to a prophet that was sent to Pharaoh. So that's one aspect. The other aspect of the prophecy is that he will be from among their brothers. So the brothers of the children of Israel are the children of Ishmael. We know that these two great nations emerged from Abraham. Abraham had two famous sons who became prophets, Ishmael the elder son and Isaac the younger son. Uh, the son of Isaac was Jacob whose other name was Israel and his progeny came to be known as the children of Israel. On the other hand, Ishmael stayed in Mecca and his family also proliferated and they came to be known as the children of Ishmael. So the children of Israel and the children of Ishmael are brothers to each other. And the prophecy says that He's going to be from among their brothers. Then the prophecy says that I'll put my words in his mouth. Now the Quran 
is one book amongst all other divine books that has been preserved completely and fully in its original form. It's a book that doesn't use the words of the prophet. It's God's own words which were revealed to the prophet. And what he did was to mention the words of the Almighty as were given to him. In other words, prophecy that says, I will put my words in his mouth, came true in the form of the Quran. The Quran is the very word of God. It isn't that God inspired a thought in the mind heart of the prophet and he expressed that thought in his own language. It was God's words that he reproduced before the world. That's what the Quran says. Then the prophecy says he will present in my name. And that is exactly what the Quran does. Whenever we start a new chapter, a new, a new surah, we say we begin in the name of the God whose mercy is profound, whose kindness is forever. Finally, the prophecy says he will tell them everything that I will command him. And the Quran asks the Prophet to mention everything that was revealed to him. Chapter 5 verse 67 says, For Messenger, communicate to them whatever has been revealed to you. For if you don't do so, then you will not have discharged your prophetic obligation. This was a prophecy in the Old Testament which comes remarkably true in the form of Prophet Muhammad. May God's mercy be on him. Now let's move on to the New Testament. The first four books of the New Testament are the Gospels, one of which is the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, in the very first chapter towards the end, from verses 19 to 21, what we find is that there is a mention that uh, there was John who started his mission. And because John the Baptist was a remarkable person, a prophet of God, he impressed people who saw him, who heard him. As a result of the popularity of John the Baptist, there were a few people who asked the rabbis, the scholars and the Levites to inform them who this person was and how to deal with him. The people in Jerusalem, they formed a group, a committee and sent a contingent to meet John the Baptist and ask who exactly he was. So, the Gospel of John tells us that this contingent comprised of uh, a number of notable scholars and other people asked him three questions. One, they asked, are you the Christ? And he said, no, I am not the Christ. So in other words, at the time of the arrival of John the Baptist, the people in Jerusalem, particularly those who were well read, who knew what was mentioned in the books of God, they were waiting for the Christ. The next question they asked was, are you Elijah? And he said, I am not Elijah. So there was prophet Elijah who was also awaited uh, by uh, the Jews, uh, their scholars uh, at the time when Jesus Christ came. So he said, John the Baptist said, I am not even Elijah. Elijah is most probably Ilyas, the prophet who has been mentioned in the Quran uh, in chapter 37. The third question that they asked was, are you the prophet? And the reply was, no, I am not the prophet. 
10. Thus ended the meeting, wherein the people that these learned people from, learned scholars from Jerusalem were waiting for, John the Baptist informed them that he was none of them. Now the question is that while we know who the Christ was, we know who prophet Elijah was, but who exactly was the prophet that the people of Jerusalem were waiting for at the time when John the Baptist arrived? If you ask any scholar in the domain of comparative religions as to who that one person could be if one were to refer to him as the prophet, you would invariably get the reply that it was Prophet Muhammad who is the first person who comes to mind when you mention the prophet. So what I'm trying to say is that even today the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament have evidences, prophecies of the prophet to come, the last prophet. And I'm not saying that these two prophecies are the only prophecies in the earlier books that we can find today. There are many other prophecies which many scholars have uh, been able to bring out from a study of the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, thereby confirming the fact that the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, God's mercy be on him, before he came to this world with the claim that he was God's representative, his arrival was already prophesied by the earlier prophets and the earlier books. So, a Jew or a Christian, when he or she learns about Prophet Muhammad, it's an information that they are getting about a prophet that their tradition is already familiar with. If they are going to accept him as the prophet of God, they are not going to accept any stranger. They would accept a person whose mention is already there in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. That is why I always say that when we talk to the Jews as well as the Christians, we should tell them that we are not challenging what you already believe in. What we are inviting you towards is to accept a man whose association with God as a prophet of God have already been mentioned in your books. By accepting and confirming him as a prophet of God, they are going to confirm their own traditions. Thank you.